by the African river, known as the Nile, the sun fell away, and it rested a while. The rhinos had braved all the smoldering heat. They lay down to sleep as they wiped off their feet. The elephants marched to their elephant beds, and gently they rested their elephant heads. The hippos went bathing in cool, shallow pools, thinking the rhinos and elephants fools. Slowly the hippos sank into the river, the water so cold that it gave them a shiver. Hippos can't swim, like the pelicans think. They also can't float, they could easily sink. Underwater, they fell to the soft river bed, on darkish green plants with a smidgen of red. They strolled on the bottom, then bounced up for air. They did it for hours, without any care. The fish followed closely and wove in and out, under their belly and up to their snout. Each of the hippos came up to the shore to feed on the grass by the river once more. They dried off their bodies by shaking and stomping, and took bites of grass, chewing and chomping. With night fading fast, they were full from the feast. The sun returned back, rising up from the east. The hippos crept off to collapse for the day, while rhinos and elephants got up to play. Enjoying the warmth of the sun and its light, never knowing the story of hippos at night. Why the Cricket Chirps by Daniel Errico Illustrated by Darina Yemeldanova Before there were seasons, the cricket could fly. He flew faster than the bumblebee. He flew higher than the falcon. And he flew fancier than the flying marmaduck, who was quite a fancy flyer. The cricket had flown all over the world. He flew to the east. Then he flew to the west and then he flew to the south, but he had never flown north. The ant tried to warn him that he should not try. It's very cold up north, said the ant. Too cold for an ant, and too cold for a cricket. The cricket, however, did not listen, because crickets do whatever they want. He set off for the north that very night. It did not take him long to get there, because he was such a fantastically fast and fancy flyer. The cricket landed next to a pine tree as the sun began setting. There was snow everywhere he looked. There was snow on the trees. There was snow on the ground. And there was snow on top of the mountains. The moose came walking over to him very slowly. Oh, hello said the moose. Bundle up. Night time is coming. The cricket did not listen, because crickets do whatever they want. He flew up into a pine tree to settle in for a good sleep. He did this quickly, because he is such an incredibly fast and fancy flyer. The owl came flying over to the same branch. You should find some shelter for the cold night, said the owl. The cricket did not listen, because crickets do whatever they want. He decided to rest on a pile of twigs. He was sleepier than he had ever been, from all the remarkably fast and fancy flying. The cricket slept all through the night until morning. When he woke up, he was ready to go home and tell the ant about his trip. He hopped high in the air to start flying, but he couldn't. Instead, he fell right back into the snow. He hopped again even higher this time, but his wings would not work. They had frozen solid during the cold night. He tried to warm them up by rubbing them together, but it was no use. The cricket had to hop all the way home, 
It took him days and days to return. By the time he got back, his wings had almost become unfrozen. When he rubbed them together this time, they made a chirping noise that no one in the forest had ever heard before. And every time he rubbed his wings together, they chirped a little bit louder and got a little less frozen. But it is important to know, dear reader, that wings are special and fragile things. This is why the greatest care should always be taken around them. They are not meant to be frozen, and once they are, they may never be the same again. Even though the cricket's wings were no longer frozen, he still could not fly. And ever since then, the cricket stays on the ground, like his friend the ant, and hops from place to place. And now the cricket is the fastest and fanciest hopper there is. At nighttime, you can hear him chirping, from rubbing his wings together to keep warm. But he is doing much more than just that. The cricket is telling you how warm or cold it is by chirping. He chirps faster when it is warm, and slower when it is cold. This way, you will not make the same mistake that he did. However, that is only if you decide to listen. Dolbear's Law states that if you count the number of times a cricket chirps in 15 seconds and add 40, it will give you roughly the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. <gasps> Are those your donuts? My name is Walter. May I have a donut? Thank you. I might get hungry later. How about another one? You still have a lot. I think that blue one is mine. I left it here yesterday. My doctor says that I need more donuts. He's a doctor. What's that? I feel bad. That last donut looks lonely. I'm sorry for taking your donuts. Sharing is about giving, not just taking. I understand now. When the universe was young, the sky was filled with planets, and stars, and stardust, and many, many rocks. One of these rocks was a bit more special than the rest. She was unlike any that came before her. She was a kind and happy rock, who always floated near a big blue planet. Sometimes, when the light hit her surface, she would glow a brilliant green. And at times like those, she almost didn't look like a rock at all. As the sky moved from day to day and week to week, the rock would see planets far off in the distance. She would wonder what it would be like to go to them. Week after week and month after month, she would wonder. Until one day when she decided to go find out. The rock had never gone anywhere before and wasn't sure how to go about it. She started to rock back and forth. Then she started to spin. Soon enough, she was flying through the sky. As she left, clouds swirled on the big blue planet. For it was sad to see her go. And when planets cry, there is a rainstorm. At first, the rock was not good at moving. She would spin too far to the right or too far to the left. Slowly, she learned how to travel whichever direction she liked, and she enjoyed exploring space. She saw a planet filled with water, with not a speck of land, then found a planet all dried up, with beaches made of sand. 
She swore she met a planet who looked suspiciously like her. And then she saw a planet that was... Well, she wasn't sure. One planet she discovered had grown forests made of green. Another one was very shy, not fond of being seen. She flew right by a planet that was frozen, icy cold. And then she saw a planet that was made of jewels and gold. She had started to notice that each planet seemed brighter than the last. They were all so different and all so pretty. It became hard for her to decide where to go next. If each planet she visited was more beautiful than the one before it, then how could she decide which way to go next? And how could she decide where to stay? So she continued traveling, afraid to miss a single planet. Eventually, she came upon the big blue planet that she had once circled, but she found that it was not the same. It was shining in a way that it never had before. It was more blue than it had ever been, and certainly more beautiful. This made her stop for a moment. I do not know where I should go next, she said out loud. Each direction is filled with wonderful planets, and I cannot stop, knowing that the next planet will be even more beautiful if I continue on. Even my big blue planet has grown more beautiful every day in my absence. The big blue planet overheard this. Can you not see why I am brighter? it asked. You are the brightest planet I have ever seen, she said. But I do not know why you glow brighter today than you did when I left you. You have brightened me, it said. But I am just a rock, she replied. You are no longer just a rock like the day you left me, said the big blue planet. You have grown bold and bright. Now you are a shooting star and you are the reason that I shine. And while you are worrying about which direction to go, all of the planets in space are hoping that you will come their way to brighten them. And so the shooting star, who was no longer just a rock, finally understood. It did not matter where she went. The light was her own. So the rock sat there for a moment, by the bright blue planet, and wondered, Should I keep traveling? Or should I fly around the big blue planet and grow brighter with it each day? She thought until she knew exactly what to do. Are you a robot? Only robots are allowed in here. If you are a robot, then will you make robot noises with me? Bleep! Gong. <laughs> Wow, those are good robot voices. Hey, is that a robot? Well, they made robot noises with me. Even... Gong. Yep. You can make noises, but can you move like a robot? Those moves are even better than mine. Hey, is that a robot? We think so. I know how to find out. The one thing robots do best is go to sleep. We will show you first. I am getting sleepy. I am a sleepy robot. Powering down. I am a sleepy robot. Powering down. I am a sleepy robot. Powering down. Your turn. How Firefly Got His Light Written by Daniel Errico and illustrated by Darina Yamoldanova. 
Long ago, there was no such thing as nighttime. Sun and moon were the best of friends, and they never left the sky. Moon looked after the quiet oceans, and sun shone brightly over all the land. Elephant lived on the plains. The sunlight made his skin very hot. He tried to cool off in a mud bath, but sun dried it up. He tried fanning himself, but his ears got tired. One day he called out to sun, You dry the ground and burn my feet. I cannot stand this awful heat. But sun did not listen, and moon did not say a word. Owl lived in a tall tree in the forest. She could not hunt in the sunlight. She tried to catch Mouse for dinner, but Mouse saw her coming and ran away. She tried eating berries instead, but they did not fill her up. One day she called out to Sun, Mouse can see me in the light. I cannot hunt with you so bright. But Sun did not listen, and Moon did not say a word. Baby Turtle hatched on the beach by the ocean. To reach the sea, he needed the tides to pull him in. He tried to swim out, but the waves pushed him back on shore. He waited for the tides to come, but they never did. One day, he called out to Moon, I need the tides to reach the seas. I beg of you to bring them, please. Moon heard the animals and she asked Sun if there was a way they could help them. Sun cared deeply for Moon, and he agreed. Together, they came up with a plan. Sun called down to all the animals. For the sake of elephant, owl, and baby turtle, Moon and I have decided to share the sky. When I rise, Moon will set and leave the sky bright. When moon rises, I will set and leave the sky dark. Moon will bring the tides each day as she travels through the sky, and it will be cool and dark, Sun continued. And when I rise, I will once again make the sky bright. But we need one of you to tell us when it is time for us to switch. It cannot be me, said Elephant, for I am forgetful. And this was a lie. It cannot be me, said Owl, for I cannot be trusted. And this was the truth. It cannot be me, said Baby Turtle, for I am just a baby. And this could not be argued. One by one, the animals declined, except for Dullfly who was resting in the shade of a banana leaf. Sun shone his great heat on Dullfly and spoke to him in a booming voice. Dullfly, this is Sun. Do you hear me? From now on, you will tell me when it is time for me to set, and we will call it Dusk. And you will tell Moon when it is time for her to set, and we will call it Dawn. I cannot, Dullfly said, frightened by Sun's loud command. I am too small for you to see. Sun exhaled and shot a burst of light straight into Dullfly's body, making it glow brightly. There, from now on, you will be known as Firefly, and you will flash your light to send us a signal, said Sun. And from that day forth, Firefly did just that. So, if you happen to catch Firefly at dawn or dusk, you must be sure to let him go, because it is he who decides when moon brings the tides, and when sun rises and sets. The Story of Yes and No Written by Daniel Errico and illustrated by Ricky Audie before words were words, 
A boy named Yes lived in a small village in a small kingdom. Yes was good at everything. He was the best, smartest, and most liked person in his village. Yes had a brother, and his name was No. No was jealous of his brother, because he was not much good at anything himself. Whenever the villagers asked No for help, he refused, because he didn't like people very much. Whenever someone asked Yes for a favor, he would gladly help, and he secretly didn't mind the fact that it irritated No when he did. One day, Yes and No's father, O.K., okay, went on a long journey, and he left his two sons in charge of all the animals. Yes took good care of the great guck, and the ix, and the three-toed yak. Keep in mind, my dear friend, that the guck, ick, and three-toed yak were very old animals, so you might know them by different names today. No didn't want to be bothered with the boring tasks involved with taking care of the animals, so instead of helping his brother, No went down to the lake and threw rocks into the water. A few days after his father left, Yes asked his brother to watch the three-toed yak while he went to find some food to eat. Instead of doing what Yes asked, No lay down, shut his eyes, and forgot about the yak. It just so happened that the king had a personal road nearby, and he traveled on it often. So often that when the three-toed yak wandered onto the road, the king's carriage was passing by and had to swerve to avoid hitting it. The king was thrown from the carriage and fell to the ground and hurt himself. The king demanded to know why a three-toed yak had been allowed on his road and asked all the villagers for an explanation. Yes was always honest, so he told the king the entire story. The king thought for a moment, and then he came up with an idea that he was quite happy with. Yes and No were to work in the castle as his personal assistants, as punishment for what was later referred to as the worst three-toed yak and carriage accident in the kingdom's history. The king needed help with many things around the castle, because a king cannot be bothered with the daily tasks involved with running a kingdom. However, soon after his decision about the two brothers, the king realized that only yes would be of any use to him as a servant. Whenever the king asked no to bring him anything, it would get thrown away, broken, or eaten, without exception. The king was quite sure that No was the worst servant in the entire world. The brother's most important task was to help pick the food for a grand party that the king was throwing later that night. Cooks from all over the kingdom lined up at the castle's gate to offer the king their food for the party. Of course, the king could not go and grab the food himself, so he asked Yes and No to do it for him. The first cook came up to the gate and yelled to the gatekeeper, I bring delicious Ugberry pie for the king's banquet. The king heard this and thought that the Ugberry pie would be perfect for such an event, and he would love to eat the leftovers. He didn't want anything to happen to the Ugberry pie, so he yelled, Yes! and then asked him to go fetch it. The next cook stepped up to the gate. I offer the king grookie soup, he said. The king didn't like grookie soup very much and he knew just how to get rid of it. No! he yelled, and then sent No out to retrieve the soup. No dropped the soup before the king could even smell it. This went on for hours. If the king liked a dish, he would yell, Yes! and it would be included in the night's feast. If he did not, everyone would hear a loud, No! and the dish would be destroyed moments later by a servant with a very bad attitude. Pretty soon, this started catching on around the kingdom. For if a king does something, his loyal subjects are never far behind. If they didn't want a second scoop of potatoes, they would say, No! And if they liked what someone was offering, they would say, Yes! And ever since that day in a small village, in a small kingdom, yes has meant yes, and no has meant no. This small kingdom also happens to be the birthplace of yes and no's cousins, Please and thanks. But that is another story for another time. Have you sailed to the island of Bum Bum Baloo? It's something that all great explorers must do. Ten years ago, I set off with my crew in search of the island of Bum Bum Baloo. The waves on the sea made me wish that I flew, 
To get to that island of Bum Bum Blue. The path on my map led us slightly askew, and we sailed every ocean before we were through. But when we arrived, it was then that I knew that all of the stories I heard must be true. The water surrounding it shone a bright hue, a magnificent color like no other blue. A sign made with vines held together by glue stood on the shore, reading, We Welcome You. The king had arranged for a great big to-do, and the queen herself shouted the loudest woo-hoo. The bum bum gave us bowls of their stew, which they made from the roots of the great bum The food could have fed 702 at the feast on the island of bum bum Our drinks were quite tasty, a tropical brew. If you ask what was in them, I haven't a clue. They served us desserts made with bumberry goo as we danced to the tune of the didgeridoo. We all thanked the king for the party he threw, of course not forgetting to thank the queen too. From their palace they showed us the wonderful view, and we all saw the fields where the bumberries grew. As gifts I gave both of them gumballs to chew. When they asked me for more I had only a few. So we hopped on the ship, where we kept the whole slew. But it got carried off when the northern wind blew. The island has waited to be found anew, while I search for someone to give the map to. And now I've decided to pass it to you, to discover the island of Bum Bum Baloo. The wolves in the woods grow as wild as trees. They do not say thank you. They do not say please. They roll in the dirt, and they chomp, and they growl. At nighttime, they look at the moon, and they howl. But Warren was different the youngest wolf pup. He would not go howl. He would not look up. Instead, he ran back to his cave to go hide. And you would not believe what would happen inside. The brightest full moon would cause Warren to change from a furry young wolf to a creature most strange. His hair would grow short and run right to his head. His paws would spread out and form fingers instead. His snout would shrink down to a small little nub, while his ears became small, like a one-day-old cub. His teeth would unsharpen, like pieces of corn, and always, somehow, there were clothes to be worn. He'd stand on two legs and start walking around, and on his behind, not a tail to be found. His parents were shocked when they saw him transform. It certainly, wolfenly, wasn't the norm. Warren became a polite, quiet joy. For Warren, you see, was a dreaded were-boy. He'd only eat sandwiches, without the crust. He didn't talk back. He preferred earning trust. They scratched at their heads when he cleaned up the cave. It wasn't how wolves had been taught to behave. His bedtime, he found, was just one tad too late, so he marched off to sleep without any debate. Instead of the floor, he would sleep on a bed, leaves for a blanket, and straw for his head. By morning he'd be a young wolf pup again. They all kept the secret together. But then... A packed celebration to honor Sinclair, the eldest of wolves with the whitest of hair. When it came time to howl, they all looked around, but the family of Warren was not to be found. They came to the cave and asked why they had hid, and that's when they saw him, a, well, a kid. A boy! they shouted. What do we do? Don't get too close or then you'll catch it too. Warren sat patiently, reading his books, but somehow that made them give wolfier looks. His parents objected. There's nothing to fear. Everyone changes, each one of us here. Warren's the wolf that you all knew before. It's just that he happens to be that and more. Sinclair stepped ahead with his scraggly knees, Excuse me, he creaked with a cough and a wheeze. I have just the test. 
and will know the truth soon. All wolves, be they true, howl up at the moon. So the pack gathered round, and they brought him outside, and Warren did something he hadn't yet tried. He lifted his head, and he puffed out his chest, looked straight at the moon, and he gave it his best, and from inside his heart, where it lay all along, came not a howl, but a beautiful song. Soon, one by one, all the wolves sat to listen until morning dew on the grass came to glisten. His parents, Sinclair, and the wolves from his pack watched the sun change him from Wereboy to back. And they saw him, this time, as they had not before, a wolf and a boy, and forever much more.